Hello, this is the American Medical Association's COVID-19 update. Today, we're discussing vaccines and teens with Dr. James Campbell, professor of pediatrics and an infectious disease specialist with the University of Maryland Medical Center in Baltimore, Maryland. Dr. Campbell, welcome back. Uh, some good news from Pfizer last week about its trials in teens. Could you tell us uh, what the company found and what it means? Sure, thanks for having me again, Todd. Um, so as the listeners probably know, we already have the Pfizer vaccine under emergency use authorization all the way down to the age of 16 because they included 16 and 17 year old data in their application to the FDA for their you know, original authorization. But there were only 150 or so in that age range uh, lumped in with the adults. And while that was going on, they were also enrolling in a study down to age 12, so 12 through 15. And they just about a week ago now announced the results of, of those, uh, those data, which were very encouraging. At this point, we only have the press release. Um, so, you know, I think we have to be careful not to overinterpret, but the press release is, is very encouraging. And that is, there are about a little over 2,000 children, uh, 12 to 15 years old. Half of them got Pfizer vaccine, two doses, same dose as adults. Half of them got placebo. And then they were followed to see who got infected. None, zero of the vaccinated children were infected and 18 of the placebo recipients. So you don't need to be a statistician to do the math. It's 100% effective with those numbers, You know, relatively small numbers, but um, very encouraging. So right in line with the same results that we saw in adults, you know, a very high efficacy. They've claimed also that the safety profile was very similar to adults, but I think we're going to need to see that to see exactly what that quote profile, you know, how many sore arms and fever and missing school and that kind of thing. Uh, the other really encouraging thing is that the antibody levels, so the thing that we think is the most important correlate of protection are neutralizing antibodies against the virus. And these kids made almost twice as much antibody as their adult, young adult compatriots. So that kind of goes along with 100% efficacy, but you know, it's also just is really good news that they're making a, a really good immune response at the same time having you know, no safety issues. So, so everybody with this, uh, obviously we'll need to go beyond the press release as you, uh, as you said before, when do you expect to see kind of more detailed data uh, that you're able to evaluate? So they've said within weeks, they'll be submitting to the FDA to try to expand the authorization age range. So to allow them to move it down to 12. So, you know, I interpret within weeks to mean that we'll have it this month at some point. And typically what's happened is just before the VRPAC, the group, uh, the independent group that helps FDA make decisions just before they meet, the data are released to the public. You can go onto the FDA website and see all of those details. So that would be my expectation is in the next couple of weeks, we'll all be able to, to see additional data. If you think about that kind of trajectory in terms of timing, do you think that we're looking at, you know, uh, kind of expanding the age range in time for school in the fall? That's the hope is that one is that the Pfizer data look as good as they seem on in press release. And the, the other company that was right behind them in very similar studies is Moderna. So as people probably remember, Pfizer came out and got emergency use authorization. And just right after that, Moderna did. And Moderna has, did a 12 to 17 year old study around the same time that Pfizer was doing this 12 to 15 year old. And you would expect that those data probably could be released soon as well. So it's possible that we could have those two, the mRNA vaccines available for teenagers, for middle schoolers and high schoolers by the summertime, uh, which would be, you know, it's not all school age kids, but at least it, it moves the needle a little bit. So you, you mentioned before about the, the, you know, the antibody levels. Is that surprising to you to find the vaccine being, you know, that level of effectiveness among this younger age group than in, you know, older folks? Is there science to kind of explain that? Uh, not, it's not that surprising. I mean, we always do want to confirm that young people make 
good vigorous uh, immune responses. But many vaccines, especially in this young, you know, teenager, young adult age range, they do really well with very good immune responses. They just have vigorous responses. I mean, if you take like HPV, human papillomavirus, as an example, um, if you give two doses of HPV vaccine to people under the age of 15, you get multiple times the amount of antibody that you get by giving three doses to people over the age of 16 for all the serotypes. So that's why the recommendation is two doses if you start it before your 15th birthday and three doses if you start it after. So that especially young, you know, like middle school, high school, you know, sort of like young adults, if you will, they just have a really nice, typically a really good immune response to these vaccines. So, and this just confirms that. When you think about constructing vaccine trials for, uh, you know, younger folks, uh, either adolescent or even uh, younger than that, you know, are these trials more difficult? Do they have unique challenges versus the ones that we set up for adults? There are some unique challenges. Um, one is, you know, is consenting. Um, it requires at that age that both the child, you know, the, the teenager, and their parent or guardian provide permission. And so it's parental permission plus child, what we call assent. So sort of a simplified version of consent. So I think that is a tricky thing to make sure that that's done very well, that you can explain the risks and the benefits both to the parents and to the teenagers. Um, Follow-up can be somewhat uh, tricky in that children should be in school. Um, and parents typically are working. And so, you know, coming up with a way that you can make a schedule that fits for families to be able to follow up. This isn't, some families believe getting into these trials is you just get the shot and somehow magically then we get the data, but it doesn't work that way. The way that we get the data is they're filling out diaries on their side effects. They're coming back to have their blood drawn. We're checking in on them by telephone or in person to examine them. So there's a lot of work involved in collecting these data. I think, you know, those are some of the, the challenges of, of doing clinical trials in kids. And I, I suppose that would get even more difficult for children under 12. Do you have any thoughts on the kind of, you know, what we'll be seeing in that age group as time passes? Yeah, I mean, it, the trials look will look very similar. Um, what we probably will not see are true efficacy trials, meaning that your primary endpoint, the 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 data, the piece of data that you're using um, uh, for your primary statistical analysis, is not going to be efficacy. What it's going to be is comparing the immune responses to older kids or to adults. And then making, if you will, the leap of faith that if you make just as good an immune response, you're gonna have just as good protection. So like a correlate of protection, what we call non-inferiority. And why is that? Because those trials would have to be so huge in young children who don't get the disease as frequently um, for us to be able to look at efficacy. And you probably just don't need that many kids to be in the trial. So you need enough to show that there's safety and enough to show that there is an immune response that that kind of mirrors an adult immune response um, to be able to, hopefully that's what we'll need to get licensure. And then the other thing is, um, you know, how you follow safety is slightly different in children than in adults. And one reason is they can't tell you everything. Um, you know, when you get down to the young child, you can't really ask them if they have a headache or if mm. they have muscle aches. So we change that into, are they not breastfeeding well, or are they irritable, or, you know, there's different uh, ways of getting at the, the safety in, in young children. And we also want to make sure that they don't have any um, child-specific side effects. In other words, if high fever could lead to worse side effects, or if they could have some other like immune problem that a, an adult didn't have. We don't have any reason a priori to believe that, but we need the data to prove that that's the case. Now you mentioned that, you know, in children of this age, younger children kind of less, you know, less likely to see, um, you know, severe cases of COVID. Is that got a, you know, an other side of that, which we can see vaccine hesitancy 
uh, because the cases are not anticipated to be, you know, as severe? What are you, what are you seeing? Uh, I, th I think, you know, every new vaccine, there's going to be some hesitancy. And I think some is, is a good amount of hesitancy. I think, you know, families should be asking the questions of, were the studies done? How well does it work? Is it safe? What kind of immune response am I going to expect from my child? But then once we show those data, I think then we will be able to reduce that amount, you know, that hesitancy. Um, now, if you, you know, in terms of the severity of the disease in children, it is true that it's much less severe, this disease, than in adults. But if you compare COVID-19 severity to other childhood diseases, it's very severe. It's more children have died of COVID this year than have ever died in any year from influenza in the United States since we've been recording it for 17 years. COVID right now is approximately the 10th most common cause of death for children in 2020. So it's, it is less severe. It's the third most common cause of death for adults. But still, being the 10th most common cause of death means this is not a, uh, you know, it's not something that's completely benign. Uh, we have three and a half million kids uh, diagnosed, something like 15,000 hospitalized, and 279 at last count died from this. So if we have a vaccine that's 95 or 100 percent protective and it is safe uh, and it's relatively easy to take with two doses, seems to me that, you know, we shouldn't have a, a huge amount of hesitancy. I think a lot of parents are going to want to, to take this vaccine. We just completed a nationally representative parent survey um, to look at what do parents think right now? And we're going to be repeating that over time as more data come out for kids. And I think what we're going to see is that it's about the same as hesitancy for other vaccines, but not something special for COVID-19. We'll be publishing that in the near future and people will be able to see the, the final results. But, um, you know, it's exciting to see that people are going to be, I think, very interested in this vaccine when we can get it to children. You know, it's interesting when you, you put it the way that you did, which is it's not an issue of severity relative to other populations uh, with the same, uh, you know, virus. It's how do you look at that versus the other things that uh, 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 that yeah. folks in this age group could get. And that's a very compelling uh, piece of data. I know that, you know, uh, especially for, for young people that, you know, seeing their pediatrician and getting uh, their normal vaccines through their, you know, normal physician practices you know, it's been, that's an important and normal way, but in this situation, at least right now, you know, we're seeing that physician practices have been kind of left out of the vaccine distribution for, for adults. You know, do we expect to see pediatricians being a bigger part of distribution as we, as this kind of uh, usage extends to younger ages? And if not, should they be? Absolutely. We do see that. And I think, you know, it's going to, each state, I think, is putting in plans for moving these vaccines out into primary care clinics, including pediatric clinics. Uh, I know that's part of in the plans in the state of Maryland where I am, and I assume in the other states. And we do know, as you said, that pediatricians are very good at vaccinating the children in their practice, at talking to parents about the data and about hesitancy and all those issues. So that's the expectation is that there will be this sort of morphing from the mass vaccination uh, public health clinics and, you know, big stadiums and things into primary care uh, and what we call the medical home, of course, where we think it is best. It's where there's a trusting relationship with your provider. It's where people are used to getting their vaccines. And as you said, pediatricians are really good at it. And that, that is what's going to happen as we move down into the pediatric age range. Well, we've, we've seen the toll uh, that this pandemic has had on, you know, all age groups in terms of mental health, but, uh, you know, not surprisingly on the mental health of children, particularly teens, you know, do you see this vaccine rollout as being, you know, a big part of addressing uh, that part of the pandemic? I do. I think, uh, as you said, the mental health issues just today, I read something on there have been approximately 40,000 children in the United States that have lost a parent this year because of COVID. So we've thought about those deaths being so horrible 
for adult because so many adults have died. But think about those families, you know, what effect that's had on the children. And the majority of them have been, of those children were, have been teenagers. So uh, also um, not being in a place like in schools, in daycares and other places where there are a lot of eyes on children, the rates of reporting of child maltreatment have gone considerably down. And it's not because fewer children are being abused or neglected. It's just because fewer people are reporting. Most reports... The, the number one place for reporting, source of reporting for child maltreatment is in the educational system. And with kids not physically being in school, they have fewer eyes on them. So I, I think having children getting the opportunity to be vaccinated and to be back completely back into society as they were before is just gonna be good, not only to prevent them from getting COVID, but all of these other sort of downstream uh, epiphenomena, if you will. It sounds like that'll be obviously a very important part of our overall efforts to get get back to normalcy for everyone. Uh, Dr. Campbell, thank you so much for being with uh, uh, us today and sharing your perspective. Uh, that's it for today's COVID-19 update. We'll be back with another segment tomorrow. In the meantime, for resources on COVID-19, visit ama-assn.org slash COVID-19. Thanks for joining us. Please take care. <laughs>